Good morning to all who attend this session organized for me and Professor Yusef Nameri of the University of Picard Jules Ben. This session is about conservative theories and application and will be very interesting taking into account the speakers whom uh, I thank in advance who have accepted uh, the invitation. Let me introduce the professor, the full professor, Jean Paul uh, Shehab, the part of the um, mathematical department of the University the Picard Jules Ben, and the researcher of the laboratoire, uh, I'm sorry for my friends, she's very no. <laughs> the mathematics fundamental he uh, applied. The professor uh, Shehab is a specialist in numerical methods for solving partial differential problems. And today um, pre uh, presents the talk uh, titled Damping, Stabilization, and Numerical Theory. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am uh, very happy and honored to participate or, to your uh, session. So uh, the talk I will give today is um, a focus on the relation between uh, damping uh, modeling for um, dispersive equation and namely for KDV equation, the stabilization of a numerical scheme when applied to uh, the simulation of reaction diffusion equation. And uh, this link will be done by an interpretation of uh, the techniques as numerical filterings. So uh, my talk is organized as follows. First of all, I will give the starting idea of uh, the links between damping and stabilization. Uh, then I will present the different damping for KDV equation and interpret them as um, um, high pass uh, filtering. Uh, then I will present the stabilization of numerical schemes and I will interpret it as low pass filtering. And then in practice, numerically, I need to have uh, at disposal uh, a tool to, to produce this filtering. And I will propose a, a simple tools based on the multi-grid approach in finite elements. Then I will apply the techniques to in two situations. The first, of, the first is the bi-grid stabilization for reaction diffusion equation. And the second one on, on which I will focus uh, is application to KDV equation. And then I will give some issue and perspectives. Well, so the starting remark is the following. Uh, we will interpret in terms of filters the two following situations. The first one is the modeling of asymptotic model in, for a dispersive model in hydrodynamics. And this model are obtained when selected regime are considered. And uh, for instance, uh, long wavelengths, which gives rise to low frequencies and small amplitude, which is exactly the case for KDV equation. And in some situation, this damping effect, the damping effect we can, uh, we, we, we can add can be interpreted as an additional term, which is a low pass filter. In the other hand, the stabilization schemes for reaction diffusion equation, uh, typically when you consider a, a semi-implicit schemes, for instance, you take implicit the linear uh, part of the equation and explicit the nonlinear part of the equation, uh, the numerical scheme are uh, traditionally subjected to uh, limitation to the time steps when you can increase the limitation. And uh, for that, you need to damp the high uh, frequency components of the equation. So you have to use a high pass filter. Okay. So, in fact, it's a low pass filter, but uh, it's represented by high pass filter in the left. I will explain the, the, the switch between the, the two. So now in this talk, we will consider the melting of the two approaches. So we'll use a numerical filter approach for building piecewise band filter for modeling the numerical damping. So the goal is to model the numerical damping for KDV equation when using numerical filters, okay? So uh, just to give a very simple illustration, uh, what we mean by filters, here you have uh, four uh, very classical case of filter the low pass filter when multiplied to, uh, to a function in Fourier space typically means that you take and change the low frequency component and you kill the high frequency ones. The high pass filter is exactly the contrary. And you can of course 
select a band of, uh, of frequency with the bandwidth pass filter or at the, uh, at the bottom uh, right, the cutoff band filter. In this talk, we will uh, deal only with low pass filter and high pass filter. But of course, uh, when considering um, several band of, uh, of uh, frequency, you can play with bandwidth pass filter or cutoff band filter. Okay, now consider the Caldwell de Ries equation. So this is the, the classical equation. And as I said, this model is obtained uh, by an asymptotic uh, technique when considering uh, special regime that are um, low frequency and large wavelength. So, uh, of course, this equation it does not represent uh, the reality and uh, we have to take into account the damping effect. So, a way to do that is to, to modify the equation by adding this term L of u, which is written in red here, and this term will represent the damping effect. So, the damping effect will of course, damp the, the size of the solution, it will damp the, typically the L2 norm. So of course, if you, uh, if you consider this equation, when you integrate by multiplying, multiply by U, you integrate into uh, the domain, you obtain that the time derivative of the L2 norm is negative because this, when multiplied by U integrated, this is zero and you have only this. So if the L of U is such that L of U, U dx, the integrate of this is positive, automatically the L2 norm is decreasing. So this is a damping effect. There are many mo models that have been proposed for KDV equation. Here's uh, some of one, the old Sudan one, uh, for Lander damping, the, the weak damping by Gidalia, Guberos and Cabral. Uh, the one which is uh, rather, um, oh, for dissipative tsunami by Dutir. Of course, you, you can consider many kind of uh, damping, such as uh, the fractional power of the minus Laplacian. Now, if we interpret the damping in terms of frequency, which is very important, we can place ourselves in the torus and uh, develop the, the, the solution in, in a Fourier series. Now, we can define the, um, the damping operator in that way. We associate to the damping operator uh, sequence, gamma k, okay? And the action of uh, L gamma to U is the following. You multiply the Kaff uh, Fourier coefficient by gamma K, which is a positive number. Of course, when you take the scalar product in L2 with U, you obtain this term, and we still define uh, a norm of this energy space, energy space associated to the damping, okay? So we'll, we will work with this. So the problem is how to use gamma K. So the special attention case to, to we will focus in when the gamma k tends to zero. That means that you will uh, make no so change the small, uh, the, the low frequency component and you kill the high, um, the, the, the high frequency components. So this is a high, this is in fact a low pass filter when considered in this time. But we will see that when associated to the time evolution, it acts as a high pass filter. Remember that KDV equation are small, uh, is, is a small frequency model. So if you want to damp it, you have to damp the small frequency component. Not uh, mandatory the high one, but the low one must be damped. So how to obtain a high pass filter effect? So. Uh, well, like to this, for uh, a steady problem, your, your gamma of U is a low-pass filter, okay? So when you multiply it in Fourier uh, space, you keep the high uh, mode component and, and not change the low one. But in, in evolutive case, it is reversed because there is a minus exponential, exponential effect. That is important to see. For instance, when looking only to the linear part of KDV equation, but that you can solve uh, formally in Fourier space. You have this, this relation, and you see that the minus gamma kT is the, the modulus of, uh, of this expression. So when gamma, t go, gamma k goes to zero as k goes to infinity, this we kill uh, only the low mode component, which is exactly the effect we want to have, okay? So this is, 
an assembly representation of the, 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 the filtering effect. So here you have a low pass filter that you, you add to the left. And when you take the negative exponential, you obtain a high pass filter, in fact. This is the exponential or low pass filter, it's a high pass filter, okay? So in that way, we will think to uh, build um, uh, damping for KDB equation. Okay, here, very uh, simple example with uh, some example of gamma K, okay? Which goes to zero as K goes to infinity. Here you have the evolution of the L2 norm of the solution for KDB equation. So it's damping, it goes to zero slowly, but it goes to zero in, in L2 norm. And uh, now here you have gamma K, sorry. Here you have the L2 norm and here you have the L gamma norm. It's the, the norm in the uh, uh, energy space associated to the damping. Okay, here the, it's the ratio of the norms. So it goes to zero when starting from a uh, soliton and you have the same solution with different uh, rates when starting for a sign initial data. Okay, so this is gamma K is one over one plus K. So it goes to zero, but slowly. You can co consider now another uh, sequence gamma k which goes to zero much faster, one over k to the two, essentially, and you observe exactly the same um, the same phenomena. So damping uh, the the low frequency is very efficient. You have not to damp very strongly the high frequencies, but you have to concentrate the low frequency because KDV equation is a low frequency model. Okay. Same, uh, uh, same effect when starting from the sign uh, initial data. Okay, now I will, I will look to another kind of problem which apparently is not related to, to this one and this is stabilization of semi-implicit time scale. This is a purely numerical problem. So you have a uh, reaction diffusion equation. Okay, you consider an IMEX uh, scheme for uh, simulating this equation. Okay, so UK is the uh, the approximation of U at time K delta T. A is morally the minus Laplacian, F is a nonlinear term. So of course this, this is not fully implicit and this is often very limited in, with the size of delta T. So a way to enlarge the, the region in which you can choose delta T is to damp the high mode component because this is the high mode component that would play a, a, an unstable role. So the idea the first idea is a parabolic perturbation. You add this term here, and T is a positive constant that must be tuned just to, to stabilize the, uh, the system, okay? This is the pure numerical approach. So we remember that we have to, to damp the, only the high mode component, but because if you damp too much the, the low component, the low frequency component, we kill the um, consistency. So it's, it's not what we want. We want only to, to uh, uh, only that the, the high mode component do not blow up, okay? So we, we need exactly a high, uh, a low pass filter effect. And we have to, to add a high pass filter to the left. This is exactly the same mechanism as uh, described above. So now we need to separate the different scale in a, for a given function. Separate the scale, that means that we, we, we have to be able to, to extract from a solution a low power frequency and high power frequency to do that, to, to build the filter. So we want to, 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 to build symbolically uh, U as U, U, bar pro, U, U, bar, U bar plus U tilde. Well, essentially U bar is the mean part of the solution and U tilde is a fluctuant one. So low frequency will be concentrated in Y, the U bar, and the low frequency U tilde. The high frequency, sorry, in U tilde. In such a way, the main part of the energy of the solution will is being concentrated in the mean part of the solution. We have many uh, techniques to do that numerically, the Fourier-like uh, approach connected to uh, orthogonal polynomial basis. This is well known. We have some techniques that come from numerical filtering. And the one in which we will focus is the multigrid. And I will present now the multigrid way to separate the scale in finite elements. And we'll apply it to KDV at the end. So the idea is uh, to, to have two uh, approximation spaces, one for the coarse grid, WH, and the one for the fine grid, VH. So WH will be able to capture only the low frequencies because it's not so fine. 
And the H is a more raffinated space and is able to, to capture the high frequency component. Okay, and we play with the two uh, spaces. So the idea is to uh, try to, to build a uh, low, uh, low frequency component in VH starting from a function for WH. It's a prolongation, in fact. And we'll do that with the elder projection in that way. This is a relation to here. So you have UH, okay, UH, which lives in WH, and you build its prolongation to VH as the solution of this system. Okay, so it's L2 projection. Okay, and in fact, it, this is very, uh, very versatile because we don't need to have the embedding VH on the, the WH, VH. We are only have to condition the angle between the, these two finite element space. I will not develop it this, but it, it's uh, rather easy to do. And uh, what, is, uh, w w what is very interesting is that you have not to be the hierarchical basis. So just to give an illustration, what is the effect of the separation of the scales when considering the resistance a 2D uh, so, uh, uh, function, this one, you have the function here, and here you have the high mode component, the Z1, okay? So when using P1 elements, so here, the L2 norm is uh, about one, and here you have uh, some, the, the, the IMR component is smaller, much smaller, and when you, and you, you can see on the, uh, on the, on the drawing, you, you have oscillation, fast oscillation, which uh, is a testimony of I a mode component. We can do the, exactly the same thing when using not P1, but P2 elements, which are more precise, as you know. And of course, the Z component is much smaller. So you have decomposed your, uh, your solution into a mean part and the fluctuant part. The fluctuant part is small in size, okay? And it carries the high frequency. This is exactly what we want to build the filters. So when looking to uh, the, exactly to the frequency component, doing like a fully like uh, analysis, you can see that you have the original signal in, uh, in red here. Okay, this is the eigenvalue of minus Laplacian. Here, this is the, the modulus of the Fourier coefficients. And you see that the, the separation of the scale, when you look to the high mode component, gives you effectively, you damp the low mode component. The high mode component are not so much um, changed, but you look, if you look to the modulus, of the low mode component Fourier coefficient, they are completely damped. So it's exactly that we want. Okay. So, okay, another illustration here with P1 elements is exactly the same thing. Sorry, now, because we, we don't have more time. Uh, what, what, two minutes? Yes, yes. Okay. One okay. Minute. One minute. Okay. okay. Okay, I go directly to the KDV question. So KDV question, okay, remember we want to, to build here um, a damping operator. So uh, we have to, 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 to build the, exactly this um, uh, low pass filter in finite elements, okay, for the linear equation. So it's very simple. We looked it to in a WH, we have this with a, a damping parameter and we have to use another parameter for the high frequencies in VH, okay? And uh, combining the two one, we have this equation that must be solved in uh, the high pass, uh, in a um, uh, fine uh, element space. Okay, so it works. Now I go directly to KDV. For KDV, I, I, I use a KDV system, which allows me to use P1 elements, okay? This is P1 elements. And now I can display the two grid approach. Okay, two grid approach. The first one, I solve an iteration by an implicit scheme in the um, uh, coarse space. Okay, then I correct it in the fine grid space with this one, the terminal red, are the damping terms. Okay, and there's a competition with, between the, the approximation in the coarse grid and the fine grid, and this makes the filter. And now I apply it. So if I take to, to zero, to one, it's got to zero, zero. That means that I have no damping. And I look to the two 
first invariant of KDB equation, namely the mass and the L2 norm. I see that the mass doesn't change and the L2 norm doesn't change also. If you look to the scale, it doesn't change. That's okay for a long time interval. So now I damp only high frequencies, high frequencies. And I, if I look to the, um, the evolution of the mass, it doesn't change. It doesn't affect the, the mass. If I look to the evolution of L2 norm, it doesn't affect the evolution of the L2 norm. So it's completely agree with the low frequency model, which is the KDB one. Now I do the contrary. I damp very strongly the low mode component and very slightly the high mode component. And I have indeed an effect of damping of all the equation of all the solution, as you can see here. So with the multigrid, I was able to, to build a filter, okay? Uh, for uh, treating differently high mode and low mode components of my model of KDV. So of course I can generalize by considering not only low pass filter and high low pass filter, but bandwise filters to make something more accurate. I need for that to, to, uh, to consider multi-grid methods. So not only two grid, but I have to, for instance, consider an embedded uh, sequence of spaces. I can do that. Uh, the idea is to try to recover numerically uh, the damping operator starting from measure. And of course, it can be applied to other modern hydrodynamics such as Boussinesque, Benjamin Ono, or shallow water. Here are some, um, uh, some bibliography that inspired this work. Okay, and at the end, muito obrigado pela sua atenção. Thank you very much for your interview. Uh, sorry for, uh, your quarter is, is very short. Maybe we don't have uh, time for questions, but uh, if someone has questions, can write in the chat and uh, the professor um, can uh, answer you. So uh, now I go to introduce uh, uh, Boasi uh, Dung Savan. Uh, I'm sorry for uh, my, <laughs> my bad uh, pronouncement of your name, Boasi. Uh, Boasi is the National uh, University of Laos and is a PhD student of uh, Laboratoire, Laboratoire Aminoir Mathematique Fundamentale and uh, Appliqué at the University of Picardy, uh, Jules Verne. Um, she go to present the talk about the traveling waves of Schistomasis model. Please, Boasi. Hello, good, good morning. Yes, this do you see my skin? Yes. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Professor Malilia, to introduce me. And thank you to the organizers and all of my, uh, all of my professor to give me to this opportunity to talk. Yes, uh, I will talk about traveling wave for cystosomasis model. Cystosomasis was first reported in 1957, public in uh, in the health impact magnitudes of the problem are uh, evident from WHO in 1774 countries. More than 600 million people are infected, uh, are at least, and more than 200 million people are infected. In Laos, population at least is estimated to 60,000 people. After six course of mass treatment with passive control du during a 10 years pro program, which leads out at cessation of the control program in 1999, the average prevalence of cystosomasis decreased to le less than 1%. Thereafter, research of cystosomasis in Laos was confirmed by WHO in 2003, which reversed that the prevalence was restored to 20 to 50%. The remission of the parasite cystosome in Laos 
indicate the need for the continue of both surveillance and control program. Now the tra transmission of cystosomiasis. The intermediate host of cystos cystosome, there are neoticura acuta and acutis neo. And like in, in the picture is the right circle of cystosome. The first is the cystosome eggs are eliminated with fish or urine depending on the species. And second, uh, under appropriation condition, the eggs hitch are liver as milicidia. And the third, we swim and penetrate specific snail in intermediate host. And four, the state intermediate include two generations of spore. Five, the production of sucaria. And six, half on release from the snail, the infective sucaria swim penetrate the skin of the human host. As what they say, what they say, seven, and said their foxtail becoming cisosome. For eight and nine, the cisosome mirage via venous circulation to lung, then to the heart, and then develop in the liver, existing the liver via the Porto VN system when mature. And 10 is the male and female adult worm copulated and copulate and lysis in the mesenteric venous. The location of this one is by species. And if this go to inside the water, is again is the this the right circle of cisosome. Now the, the model of the, uh, the model with humans and, and snail. Let this be a prevalent of human host. S is the prevalent of snail host. G is the recovered for human host in infection. B is the rate of snail infection to human. Sigma here is the density of human host. Delta is the de density of snail. AH is the rate of incident for one single human host. And as we know, snail stay inside the, the liver and mu is the dead rate of, of snail. U is the pro of li liver. By the loss model, we can have these two, two equations. Uh, since we are con considering the, the di diffusion inside the liver, and we will add also the di diffusion and transport due to the li liver flow. We add like a this two two term to the uh, loss model. And now the the quasi steady state, assuming that the dead rate of the snail is faster than the recovered of human in infected. We saw from the first equation we we saw like this, and then the the second equation or for the uh, the snail equations be, become to this equation. Uh, and then the, the progressive wave are the so solution of, of the form. Uh, ST equal to V X minus C, CT, which related to unstable equilibrium to the stable equilibrium. Here C is the denote the wave wave speed. If C is uh, negative, that means we have the traveling wave from the left uh, from the right to left. 
if C is positive, we have the traveling wave is from the right, the left to right. By the change of, of a variable, the PDE turn, turn to the say, second ODE. It's like this equation. Let V equal, uh, let W psi equal to V prime psi. We obtain the system of first order or ordinary differential equation. Yeah, we, we get the first system like, like this. And then we let the theorem one to solve this problem. It means in the theorem one, it means that uh, we saw the V and W is uh, bounded. Same previous system, we can have the uh, we can have two equilibrium. One is uh, zero zero, and the second and the, the, this equilibrium. And let R zero equal to B his uh, sigma his delta his over the new pass uh, U prime G G his. This is, uh, we note that this is R0 is the re reproduction num number. And then the th theorem two is uh, if B has sigma has A has minus mu plus U prime G has greater than zero and R0 greater than one, then the equilibrium Point is zero, zero is asymptotic stable, and the, se the second equilibrium is unstable. Now we are looking for the solution we connected unstable to the stable e equilibrium. Since the theorem two, we can get the, uh, we know that the, the limit exists but we, we don't know they are connected. This is what we are going to, to show. Like this, uh, we know the limit is, the, this uh, limit is unstable and this is, is uh, stable. Like uh, the, the picture, we want to show that they have the connected between uh, unstable point to the uh, stable point. Uh, now we are turn to the turn our attention to the property of tra trajectory. Uh, then we, we consider the, this this equation. We consider the, this equation and then we give the theorem three. Theorem three. There exists a so solution W on the interval on this interval and satisfying this con condition if and only if C greater than the critical core speed. For the critical core speed, we can find from the theorem two. Yes. And then the, num the num numerical simulation, the value of all parameters are chosen in the argument with the previous the theorem. All the parameters are is positive. Now th this picture we can see the tra trajectory and the connect connection between the unstable point to the stable point. And this picture we show that the, uh, there exists the traveling wave for the cystosomesis. Yeah. Like uh, this is the traveling wave from the left to right. Uh, this is all of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Iguasi. So I don't know if someone have questions for Iguasi. Uh, let me see if I find something. Mm, no. Uh, no, Nabil is writing a question. 
Nabil, do you have uh, one question? Please, Yusef, if, if you know. Um... So the question is, so V is not C1? Yeah, so the question of Nabil is, V is not C1, only C0? Uh, is the... Is the function V uh, C1 or just continuous? The function V is uh, C1. Okay. Um, you have more questions for the Wasi? No? Let me see because maybe he's here another question. No, is it the same? So I, I have a, a one question. Uh, Boasi, um, when you introduce the, the model, the, the scheme for the model, um, you uh, have um, X as um, a, a point, a specific point in time for a um, but I didn't understand very well what is for you the, the position X. The, the position X is mean the uh, the li li liver bank is uh, how can I say the point that uh, It's okay, you can explain me after, okay? Because I, I want to understand what is it and why you use uh, the model in uh, 1D and uh, so, but I need to understand what is X in fact. But you can explain me after. Thank you very much. So, uh, Youssef, maybe you can proceed um, the session. Thank you, Pasi. Very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank Steph, you. You can proceed. Please, you, we cannot hurt you. You need to connect to the macro. Yusef. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, my dear. Okay, thank you, Pasi. So the next speaker is uh, Erwan Angon. So Erwan is an assistant professor in the uh, Universidad del Biobio for these last few days. And he uh, will uh, be a uh, maître uh, de conference in, uh, from in, in September. So and Erwan will uh, present uh, some uh, of his work. Uh, and uh, this one is about uh, Lifshitz leave this Lirozov equation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, uh, Youssef. Uh, thank you, Marilla, también, uh, also for, for the invitation in this session. Uh, indeed, I will present a few, few results about the leave this of equation uh, with nucleation. Uh, I will explain, of course, uh, what is about this, uh, this equation first and uh, why, uh, why we speak about nucleation. Um, at the beginning, uh, we start with uh, a statistical uh, system uh, where we have uh, particles uh, that may, uh, that uh, who uh, underlying dynamics is to, uh, to merge together uh, uh, to form bigger and bigger uh, uh, aggregates. And so this applies to a lot of uh, different uh, um, Phenomenon, for instance, the droplet formation of uh, water, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in vapor. Uh, also, you can see that in sedimentation, uh, for instance, uh, or also in the plankton uh, in oceans that can aggregate each other, and then uh, when uh, you reach some uh, some heavy uh, heavy uh, uh, weight, uh, you 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 go down, uh, you, you may go down. Uh, also, uh, most of the applications that I was concerned. Uh, is polymeriz polymerization in biology, in particular uh, polymerization of, uh, of proteins that form polymers. Uh, uh, 
uh, in fact, in prion, that is a MATCO uh, disease, and the Alzheimer's of the Tinkton, that is uh, linked to, to polymerization of uh, protein. Also, it applies to other uh, domains in uh, biology, like lipids formation and uh, uh, stuff like that. And origi originally, the lipschitz of equation was uh, built for crystallization and uh, related problem uh, in uh, chemistry. And I work also uh, with uh, this kind of stuff uh, on absorption, uh, uh, that is uh, the aggregation of, of on the surface. So in fact, we start with uh, uh, particles that can be monomers or atoms that will uh, aggregate each other and form more and more uh, greatest uh, uh, structures that we can call cluster or aggregates here. And we track the dynamics of that problem along the time uh, uh, and uh, uh, normally, uh, <clears throat> the traditional dynamic is to form at end uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to have a, a fast transition, that is to form a big structure uh, uh, where you start from particle, unsoluble particles in a, in a, that are dilu diluted uh, in, a, in the system, and then, for instance, you 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 go back from you you go from proteins, and then at the end you have polymers that are unsoluble. Okay, so you can you, you try to track that kind of dynamics in uh, in that system. So it's very uh, large, uh, and um, we can uh, describe the, the problem uh, uh, very easily by chemical reaction, uh, where we uh, denote the cluster of made of E monomers or E atoms, uh, Y, sorry, uh, uh, by C, Y, and a uh, um, cluster of size Y can join with a cluster of size uh, J, and then it forms the biggest one that is composed of Y plus J uh, uh, atoms or, or monomers. And also, uh, a small one can go back and separate to give rise to two smaller uh, uh, clusters, okay, with some rates that are defined by the, 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 the application we are looking okay. uh, This is the general coagulation uh, fragmentation problem uh, because we can merge any, any kind of size. Okay. In this kind of problem, we are not looking at, uh, we are not, not looking at the size, uh, we are just looking at size, we are not looking at uh, space consideration. We, we suppose that the system is very well mixed uh, 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 and we, could, we do not uh, care about that. Of course, such model can be very, uh, very much generalized. The Lipschitz laws of equation is based on uh, uh, some model uh, that is to consider that we can build up the construction of aggregate just one by one, adding one atom by one atom, okay? And you can just release one atom from the structures, okay? So for instance, this, this uh, structure with three can release one to become two or gain one uh, atom to become four, okay? This is a sub, uh, a sub model, but in fact, it gives rise to very different kind of, uh, of uh, mathematical uh, equation at end. And uh, the equation built from uh, that kind of reaction, uh, if we consider the density, because we are concerned with the, the distribution of clusters uh, by size, uh, and if we know the size X, we can perform some scaling in that kind of system with a small parameter that can be, that can describe the size of, the, of an atom or the mass, for instance, that is very small. Huh? Uh, and we made the, the length variable or the, the size variables a continuous variable so that we can construct a nice distribution huh? that we call FTX. So it describes the distribution of, uh, of aggregates by size. And then from that kind of dynamics, doing the same with the rates, huh? instead of seeing that uh, the rates uh, associated to a size Y, we, we see it associated to the X variable that is a continuous size we get uh, uh, the continuity equation here, that is a one uh, dimensional equation, where the, the, the density F is transported simply according to a flux that is given by AX C1T minus BX, okay? So this represents the aggregation here and the uh, second order reaction and the, the fragmentation, in fact, one by one. Uh, but this is infinitesimal because we just had one atom or release one atom at that time. C1, that is the quantity of uh, atoms, in fact, since the cluster of size one, uh, uh, is, is given by the mass conservation in the system. That is this equation 
hein, uh, where the integral represents, in fact, the total mass of uh, atoms in the system being in the clusters. So this, this is uh, a constant in the system. So we recover here hein, C1 as a constant minus this integral. So this makes the problem a nonlinear problem on non-autonomous equation. Okay. The equation is defined on the half line hein, because it just defines for x positive, hein, for, for the positive size hein, on that only time. So uh, when we do that, when we look at this equation, there is a question uh, what we should put uh, at x equal as to zero hein, in those first equation. So we should put some uh, boundary condition if needed. Of course, if the flux is uh, incoming, uh, of it, if it is outcoming, there is no need. So if it is incoming, what we should uh, put uh, as a boundary condition? Uh, what means that x equals, the size x equal to zero? In the scaling we perform, a cluster of size zero is in fact an atom. So the, the size zero is how we are creating new cluster in the system from two atoms, in fact, okay how we are creating cluster of size two, in fact. So we have to uh, put a, a boundary condition, and there is some uh, uh, difficulties that arise from the kind of coefficient we are looking for that are typically power low, uh, with uh, coefficient here, alpha and beta, that are between zero and one. This is not a Lipschitz coefficient or, uh, or uh, such regularity. We answer the, 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 uh, with, uh, with two colleagues, uh, uh, Julien Deschamps and Romain Vinec, that the uh, right condition is this kind of, uh, of uh, condition, that we should put uh, a, a trace or uh, a boundary condition, uh, flux, uh, incoming flux, that is uh, C1 square, that, is nat that naturally arises from the, the, the law of mass action at the boundary. In fact, we give some other kind of, of condition, but this is uh, more... Uh, acceptable. And uh, this, of course, made sense only when uh, C1 make this term uh, basically positive. This is not because you know that if A and B are, are power low, this is zero. Okay? But if we, if we factorize that flux, uh, we can uh, then perform a, a, a change of, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this equation and obtain this kind of, uh, of, uh, of boundary condition. Okay, so when C1t is greater than this, uh, this value, uh, that is the limit of B over X at zero, uh, this term is well defined and we should could, uh, put that, uh, that condition. Of course, it becomes singular when C1t reaches this threshold uh, and uh, we will have to do uh, some, uh, some stuff at, at this point. Uh, what, is, uh, what is to mention here? Um, uh, this, is, this appears as the, 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 the space in which we should work to have a, 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 a trace for f. Huh? This is a times f, in fact. And this means that um, the, 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 come on, the rate of creation of new cluster is given by this term. Okay? Only when we have unos atoms. Huh? C1t greater than 5 sub 0 means that we have unos atoms to create new, new cluster. If it is below, these terms uh, become negative and it is outgoing and we do not create new, new cluster, okay? They will disappear by, dis by fragmentation. Uh, how we construct solution to that equation? Well, we just uh, go to characteristic formulation. Uh, and uh, with power law, we have naturally uh, the rate in W11, uh, but uh, of course, this is not bounded. Huh? We are not Lipschitz. Huh? So we solve that, assuming that the, the aggregation rate, that is the, 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 the term that push the, 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 new, uh, the new cluster, uh, to be, uh, it's inverse to be integrable. Okay, what it means, it simply means that if you, uh, the, the small cluster or simply or the characteristic go back to zero infinite time, or we can start from the boundary condition uh, and go on in, uh, in the system. So we are creating new cluster from, uh, from zero. Okay, this is down, uh, uh, constructing the, the, the life, the backward lifetime of the characteristic that is given by this quantity, sigma t. Uh, and we prove that, we, in fact, we have a nice, C1, uh, a nice diffeomorphism uh, between 0t on that part. 
And of course, big cluster hein, uh, come from the, uh, the initial condition. So here we use uh, well order uh, of characteristic, and we are uh, we take uh, uh, we, we 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 use in fact that uh, that uh, that uh, that we we work in a, in a one dimensional framework. Okay. This is separated, of course, by, by the, the cluster that come from zero at, uh, at initial. Okay. So this is the case where uh, we are uh, again uh, in common. With that uh, that uh, consideration, we can co we can construct nice uh, uh, characteristic formula for the for the solution, and we can plug that uh, uh, that expression to 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 have a, a, a weak solution. So we have the part. Uh, here that come from the initial condition, and this is the term that creates uh, uh, along the time uh, a distribution of, uh, of cluster according to the nucleation. Uh, that is a distribution that is uh, coming uh, at that, uh, that size. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how many time I have. Uh, in fact, in that work, we can generalize a bit to understand what is the simply the linear uh, the linear transport equation like that. Uh, and when we can factorize the flux by by a uh, by uh, some function a that is uh, with inverse uh, that is integrable and basically with w uh, being a w one one function. That is strictly positive in zero. We can construct a solution to to that kind to that kind of uh, of, uh, of equation. This is related to a change of variable. Uh, we have to lift the flow at uh, at the origin to to, can to to so that we can uh, separate all the characteristics and prove that they they cannot uh, coming from just one point. This is technical stuff and not really important. But this kind of uh, variable. Uh, this function W here, in fact, relate to the classical uh, uh, theory of the Alliance, where we, we, we recover uh, uh, the, 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 the traditional results. Well, the, the results that we can uh, hope uh, from that, uh, that uh, consideration is to construct a solution uh, when the initial condition is in this space, that is, of course, initially we have to have the mass to be finite, so we have to be integrable against x. Also, the number, uh, the integral of f is simply the number of clusters. Uh, so we consider that both are finite initially. This, of course, entails that ax dx is finite also. Uh, and uh, we can construct a, a solution that is continuous in time. But we are, consider we are considering just ingoing uh, uh, solution that is we start from uh, a number of, of monomers that is uh, above a threshold. Uh, so we have two options that is uh, uh, the solution is global uh, and at every time this is above the threshold or we can reach that, frame, that threshold. So the boundary condition becomes singular at that time. Okay. And the solution is finite. So basically, the number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, atoms here start above the threshold, and infinite time you reach that. And you have to give another sense to the solution after that time. And maybe you have to, to join, uh, to match the, 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 two, the two kind of solution incoming and uh, outgoing. So this is basically the maximality of the outgoing solution, of the incoming uh, solution. And the question of the maximality uh, and, and then the globality uh, is to match both solutions coming and going. And thanks to some uh, estimate on the, on the derivative of the number of uh, atoms in the system, we can prove sometimes it's global for some kind of coefficient. And some other, we can prove that it reached infinite time. And infinite time, the derivative is strictly negative. Okay, we pass, really, we will pass the threshold. Uh, we will not leave. Stay on the on the threshold and, and, and stay uh, like singular. So we should we should prolong the solution of the, after the threshold. Here are the kind of characteristic we can have in the system. So you are incoming and that we are you are outgoing. Okay. And so the idea should be to 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 prolong a bit at epsilon uh, the flow after the threshold. Construct a solution that is outgoing. And then to, with some stability result, to match the solution, uh, the outgoing solution to the incoming solution at the time t, where, where we have the, 
the, the singularity. Okay. Of course, some other techniques uh, might be uh, used, uh, like viscosity solution, maybe that include well uh, uh, the, 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 the boundary condition uh, into, uh, into the formulation. I would like to finish just with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the large time, the long time behavior of the, the problem that is really uh, uh, challenging too. Uh, we can have several uh, because uh, you, the flux is uh, a uh, basically the flux is here. Uh, so depending if it goes if C1 goes to a steady state, okay, but depending on the function here that is B over A, this, this uh, term can cancel. Okay, so it can cancel on some points, on some size, and you can create some kind of, uh, of Dirac at that, uh, at that point. Uh, the, the mass can, uh, can generate a Dirac. So this means that uh, we are, we are uh, creating some preferential size uh, in the system at end. We will have that like a kind of one size uh, uh, in the system. We can, of course, depending on this function, create uh, several Dirac's at, uh, at end. And also uh, we can uh, create a Dirac in zero. Uh, that is uh, the disappearance of, uh, of the system that we, we will create just uh, atoms and we will not create cluster uh, in the system. Of course, we can go, uh, have the traditional, uh, uh, the traditional solution of lipschitz Klerosov in outgoings. That is a, a self-similar solution at infinity. We are creating very, very, very big uh, cluster. Uh, so it is a, a challenging uh, question too, uh, and it is also challenging at a numerical level, of course, to, uh, to track the formation of that Dirac uh, uh, in, the, in, the long time, uh, in the long time behavior. Uh, <clears throat> of course, this, is a, 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 this equation is a building block for uh, several kinds of applications where we should put uh, diffusion, uh, other interaction, reaction terms, and so on. Hein? We just start to analyze a, 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 a part of that, uh, of that kind of, uh, of, uh, of problem uh, to, to try to, 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 to drop the, 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 the difficult part of, of, that, of that term. Uh, in, the, in the equation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope I... Okay, thank you, thank you, Juan. So, yeah. Juan is able to answer uh, the question in, uh, in Portuguese and in Spanish, and in French. So, don't I be shy. Have... For you. <laughs> Portuguese. No, don't be shy if you have uh, uh, any question. If you have time, maybe for one question. Tu veux pas, Joachim, faire ta petite question? <laughs> so, uh, no, it's okay. It was nice. So, so, we have some questions that maybe we can discuss later. <laughs> yes, yes, it's okay. So, Muito obrigado. We need, we need a long answer. <laughs> okay, so, I'm just waiting because maybe there's some delay with the other one. No, so thank you. Thank you, Awan. Thank you, Yusef. So we have just one, two minutes. Okay, we just wait one, min one minute. So, but maybe you can already share your screen. And during this little space, let me tell to Professor Jean-Paul Shehab, I sent you a question. I don't know if you uh, did, um, if you saw it or not, but uh, if you can, please answer me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry, I saw your question. Thank you very much for your uh, interest. Uh, well, um, I don't know how no, you, to, uh, we to... can discuss after. Yes, yes, with pleasure. With pleasure. You, okay. Do you have my mail? Uh, yes, please send me a right hand in the chat and I send you. Okay, with great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I think you can talk. No, there's no sound. You can speak like that. No? Okay. 
So, okay, so, uh, so this is time. So the last speaker of the our, our session. So we are very honored to have uh, Professor Weidenman. So he's a professor in, uh, so sorry for my uh, uh, Dutch accent. So Stellenbosch University, I think, in South Africa. So he's an international expert in numerical method to solve uh, nonlinear PD, but not only for PDs. And today he will present some of his work on the uh, complex singularity for nonlinear PD. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Right. Um, uh, thank you very much. I'm honored to be a speaker in the session. Um, uh, it, it's a talk about nonlinear PDEs, but very simple ones, ones that we all know and love, like the Burgers equation and uh, the KDV equation that we already saw in the first uh, talk of the session. Uh, but we're going to do something different, and that is we are going to see what these um, uh, solutions that we normally just see on the real axis, what they look like in a complex plane. Uh, and, 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 and maybe we can get some new insights and at least we'll see some pretty pictures, I hope. Uh, it, it ties me to, uh, it brings me to these, these two quotes. Uh, these are two of my favorite quotes in mathematics. The first is by Panlevé, which says that the shortest path between two truths in the real domain goes through the complex plane. And that is uh, what he's trying to say there is if you have a, a feature or a property uh, of a function and you see it only on the real axis, then you don't see the full picture. You have to go into the complex plane to really see everything. Uh, and the other uh, famous quote is the one by Kruskal uh, shortly after the discovery of the soliton who said that uh, these solitons can be seen as a parade of poles in the complex plane. And uh, hopefully I'll show you some pictures later on of exactly that. Um, some of you may have been to my talk in, uh, at IKEA 2019 in Valencia. Uh, and this talk is largely based on that. You'll see several of the pictures that are the same, but, but towards the end, there are some new stuff, which I, I hope you will enjoy. Okay, uh, well, the, the, the prime example in this um, area is, uh, is the v Burgers equation without viscosity. Um, so uh, we uh, will just uh, assume two pi periodic conditions right throughout this talk and start off initial conditions with something like a sine or a cosine, very simple. And we all know what this is going to do. The, uh, so initial condition, which is here, it's the negative of the sign. As time evolves, the profile steepens and at time equal to one in this case, a shock forms right at the origin. Uh, and, and we've all seen this sort of thing before and we know how to uh, analyze that by the method of characteristics, for example, uh, leading to this implicit solution formula. And one can uh, explain all of that pretty well. But this, uh, there is a different viewpoint and that is the one by uh, these people down here. And that is to view this singularity formation uh, when you look into the complex plane as a pair of branch point singularities traveling on the imaginary axis. And as they travel down, they meet right on the real axis at the time of shock formation. And one can show that those are square root singularities as they travel down. So the multiple valuedness of the, of the shock can be connected to the multiple valuedness of the algebraic singularity. Uh, the paper I'm talking about that got me into this business is uh, this one by uh, two uh, French uh, physicists, I believe they are. Uh, and uh, what they did was uh, exactly what I just explained, except they did not use the sign initial condition. They just used a uh, cubic polynomial. And the reason they use a cubic polynomial is then this implicit solution formula can be, uh, 
we can be uh, solved explicitly. Um, uh, they showed by doing that then that you have these two branch point singularities traveling down and meeting on the real axis. Uh, they could also continue it through the uh, through the point of shock, but we won't do that. We'll just stop right there. When I saw this uh, the first time, and this was uh, in the 1990s, in the uh, late 1990s, I was fascinated by this, and I thought, how would one compute this? Uh, and, and I saw that as a personal challenge, and that's pretty much how this whole thing started for me. I, I uh, of course, I did other things in between, but I return to this periodically, and I have some fun with it. And I hope you like the pictures as well. Um, here's just some um, uh, formulas uh, that I'll be quoting. Uh, for this particular problem, before we go on to more difficult problems, I've mentioned the implicit solution uh, formula. There's an explicit solution in terms of a Fourier series. Uh, we won't use that uh, because it's too special. We'll just uh, compute Fourier series numerically, as we'll explain. Um, this location of the singularity, these branch points as they travel, on the imaginary axis, uh, we have an explicit formula for them uh, into, uh, that's given here that just comes from a singularity analysis of the implicit solution formula. Uh, and the graph of that is, is right here. So um, you see at time t equal to naught, uh, the, the singularity in the upper half plane is at plus infinity, and then it travels along the imaginary axis and it reaches the real axis at about time t equal to one. Of course, there's a conjugate partner of this singularity in the lower half plane doing the same thing. Right, now how are we going to solve this? How are we going to compute this behavior numerically? Um, it's a two-step process that I thought one should use. Uh, the first is to just solve the equation uh, numerically on the real axis as one would normally do. Uh, finite differences, finite elements, except I'll be using spectral methods here because I'm assuming two pi periodicity, a Fourier spectral method will ju work just fine. Uh, and then once you've solved it into uh, on the real axis, then you have to somehow extend it into the complex plane. So the first step, as I said, is just a Fourier spectral method. Um, you plug it into the equation. The quadratic nonlinearity becomes a convolution sum. The uh, derivative with respect to x is represented by i times the wave number. And so you end up with a system of evolution equations for the Fourier coefficients. Um, thinking back to our first talk this morning, there's no damping here, except that we throw away the, the large wave number components to turn this into a finite dimensional system, which we can then uh, solve with uh, a, a, a numerical integrator in time. Here I'll be using MATLAB's ODE45, uh, uh, and, but I'll be making the tolerances very small, very tight, so that uh, we have a very uh, good approximation, I hope, of the actual solution before we start thinking of going into the complex plane. Uh, the Fourier series, of course, is no good for going into the complex plane because the moment you complexify this x variable, you're gonna pick up a positive uh, exponentially growing component into the upper half plane and likewise into the lower half plane. So we can't use the Fourier series for uh, extending into the complex plane. So what will we do? What can we do? Well, there are two methods that are typically used for this kind of thing. Um, it's the Darbo theorem uh, that I'll explain in a second and also Padet approximation. Um, and I will discuss both of these quickly uh, with reference to uh, a power series because that's easiest to explain. Uh, Keep in mind that when we solve PDEs, we're not going to use the power series, we're going to use Fourier series, as I explained, but it's easy enough to convert a Fourier series into a power series. You just split the sum into the positive and the negative wave numbers, 
and then you introduce a new variable z is equal to e to the i theta and now you have two power series so we'll just discuss the power series uh, but keep in mind that when we solve the pdes we really deal with fourier series okay so here is the darboe theorem it says something like the following suppose you're given the power series what can you say about the singularities of the function all you know are the coefficients it says the following, if, if this power series looks like a singular part times a regular part that converges in a, in a fairly biggish region, well, then you can find the position of the singularity, that's the Z star, and its type, the alpha, by looking at the asymptotic decay of the coefficients, right? And in particular, you have this explicit formula for the asymptotic decay of the coefficient. So in practice, if you have a large number of these AKs, uh, you can linearize this expression and you can solve for the Z star and the alpha by just the method of least squares. It's just a backslash of MATLAB. Uh, for those of you who are of my age or older, uh, in the older books on uh, perturbation methods, um, they've done this sort of thing graphically, and they called it a doom sykes plot, but we'll just do it numerically. It's, it's slightly tricky because uh, uh, you have to decide which coefficients you're going to use. Maybe you don't want to use the first few because there might be some transient effects. On the other hand, if these AKs comes from a numerical computation, uh, maybe the higher ones will be uh, you know, corrupted by round of error once you get down to machine epsilon. So it's, it's, it's kind of tricky to decide which ones um, to use, but, but still it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it can be done. Right, let us um, look at what the Burgers equation uh, looks like if we do this. Um, can I just hear, uh, am I just, are people still hearing me? I, Yeah, is, is that okay? Because I, I, uh, I, I, I haven't gotten used to this kind of giving a talk, but that's good to know. Okay, There's so also 10 of our people who are just watching, but you can. Uh, that's good, it. thank you. Yeah. Um, so let's see uh, what the Darbo estimates give for this particular Burgers uh, computation of ours. In this case, I've just used uh, the coefficients five through 25. And um, on the left here, you see uh, the location of the singularity. Uh, the, the, the blue curve, that is um, uh, how the, uh, the Darbo estimates predict uh, the location of the singularity to be. And uh, the, the red curve, uh, well, that's from the theory. Remember, we have an explicit expression for the uh, location of the singularity uh, from theory. And so we can compare and we see it's a, it's a rather good match, except here in the beginning where the singularity is still too far from the real axis. So the things are not so accurate. Um, the uh, classification is maybe a little bit less uh, satisfactory. Uh, these uh, singularities are uh, square root singularities. So that corresponds to alpha equal to a half. That's the red dashed curve. The numerical approximation that we get from the Darbo estimates, the least squares fit, is reasonably good, not perfect. And then it turns into a cube root singularity at the, at the match, uh, at, the, at the time the shock occurs and that matches the theory, so, so, so that all checks out. One can improve this fit over here by playing a little bit with there's a range of coefficients that one uh, uses in the Darbo estimate, but then uh, you lose accuracy here in the beginning. So it's really a, a bit of an art to pick the right coefficients to get a good uh, classification. The alternate to the Darbo theorem is to use Padet approximation. Now Padet approximation is just the rational equivalent of uh, the Taylor series. Uh, again, let me explain that to you uh, by using a power series expansion. Uh, we want to convert that to 
a rational function, maybe degree n up top, degree n at the bottom, we call that a type nn approximation. And that is easy enough to do. Uh, you just clear the denominator, you take the q to the other side, uh, and likewise the p, uh, and then you uh, have unknown coefficients for the p and unknown coefficients for the q, uh, but when you uh, collect terms and uh, knock out the first so many powers of z, you end up with a, a linear system from which you can solve the p's, the coefficients of the p and the coefficients of the q, uh, and then you have a rational uh, approximation to f. And now this you can take into the complex plane much more uh, easily than just the power series. Um, uh, the, the only problem is you only have poles as uh, approximate in your approximation space. Uh, you can't approximate um, branch points, for example, like we had in the Burgos equation. Uh, to get around that or to improve the, uh, the regular Padet approximation, you can go to so-called quadratic Padet approximation, and that is just to extend this formula by slipping in also a square of the f and introducing the new polynomial r. And so you can knock out a few more powers of z, but again, you can solve uh, for the coefficients of the p, the q, and the r by uh, solving linear systems. And then you set the right-hand side to zero and you can solve for the f by the quadratic formula. And in that way, you have introduced at least square root singularities into your approximation space. Now, you don't have to stop there. You can also include the, the f cube term. That would be cubic Padet approximation or more generally Hermite Padet approximation. But for the purposes of this talk, we'll just stick to the quadratic case. Uh, so let us see what it looks like uh, when we apply this to the Burgos equation, but before that, we'll have to quickly uh, explain how I'm going to represent results, uh, and that is by using phase plots. Uh, the reason we want to do that is because, you know, the Darboe theorem only gives us two bits of information, namely the location of the singularity and the uh, classification, whereas Padé approximation actually allows us to compute the solution in the complex plane and so we can represent it as a picture. So let me explain to you that representation. Uh, we'll be using phase plots. Uh, and, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, but uh, let me explain it very quickly. It, I'm using the very nice software of Elias Vega to, uh, to, to plot these phases. And that is we just simply color code the theta in the phase e to the i theta. So, so the red corresponds to theta equal to zero. Uh, the cyan corresponds to theta equal to pi, etc. So the picture we see over here on the left, that's just the, the identity function. W is equal to z. So we see the zero is at the origin. That's where all the colors meet and then they run one once around all the colors. Uh, and so you can easily tell, for example, if you have a, a zero of multiplicity two, the colors will simply go around twice. Each color will appear twice. So um, in our uh, plots, we're going to be looking for poles uh, like this one, one over z squared. And here again, we see it's a pole of order two. Uh, the colors appear twice. Uh, how do you tell uh, a zero from a pole? Well, the colors run the other way because you have uh, uh, e to the minus i theta if, effectively. So the colors go the different way. So the green goes before the yellow when you have a pole, whereas if you have a zero, the, the yellow goes before the green if you go clockwise. And then we'll be looking at, in, in these plots for uh, branch points and you can tell them by, uh, by the fact that if you go around once, there's a jump in the, uh, in the phase. In this case, we jump from yellow to, to, to blue on the negative real axis. Uh, that's a branch cut, of course, that uh, our software system picks uh, the classical choice, uh, well, the, the usual choice of the negative real axis. So these are the, uh, that's the representation representation we're going to use in the next few slides. So um, so 
again, in our Burgers equation, we now have this Fourier series that we've computed by our Fourier spectral method. Uh, and now let's use the first 36 coefficients to construct uh, Pade approximants. Well, it will be Fourier Pade approximants because we have a Fourier series. So over here on the left um, is, is what I believe to be the exact solution for all practical purposes. Uh, because I've just solved the implicit solution formula to high accuracy. Time is 0.5, so this is not quite yet at the shock formation. The singularity has traveled down the imaginary axis uh, and it reaches the branch point is right about here. I'm just showing the upper half plane because there's a similar picture in the lower half, just a conjugation uh, essentially. Um, so on the left, I think that's the uh, that's the correct phase plot. And, and now what the Pade approximation gives you is this. So uh, in, in most of the picture, the agreement is, is more or less perfect. Uh, right here on the branch cut, the uh, approximation is not so great because as I said before, the um, the Pade approximation cannot do branch cuts. It can only do poles. And what uh, Pade does is, in, in order to mimic this jump in phase, it puts the uh, poles and the zeros successively on that branch cut to sort of mimic the jump in phase. Um, that's a well-known phenomenon in Pade approximation. Um, it's um, it's often referred to as that these poles fall in the shadow of the branch point. Now, this is regular part A. If we extend this now to, uh, to quadratic part A, where we introduce uh, the, the square roots into our approximation space, well, then we get a much better uh, approximation. Now, we have pretty much recovered the uh, reference phase plot perfectly. Well, it's not perfect because if you compute errors, the errors are on the order of 10 to the minus four. Uh, I should point out that's the error right near the singularity. If you go away, uh, the errors are much smaller than the 10 to the four, but, but you'll agree we have a very good approximation of the actual uh, phase plot. And now the question is, uh, uh, can we use these methods to, uh, to, 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 to apply to PDEs for which we don't have as much theory as for the inviscid burgers equation? And so that's what we'll do in the next few slides. Uh, just to recap quickly, the um, uh, a comparison between the Darbo and Pade methods. As I said before, the Darbo only gives us two bits of information, the location of the singularity and an estimate of its classification. Uh, Pade at least gives us a picture of, of the solution. So uh, not just the nearest singularity, but also hidden ones. Uh, but it's these things are tricky to use. In the Darbo case, you have to decide on what range of coefficients to pick. In the Pade case, we have to deal with ill conditioning of those linear systems. And that is why you will have noticed that I've used fairly low degree approximations, because if you push this degree up much higher, uh, this means we add a degree 11, 11, 11. Uh, uh, so that that's on the order of uh, 35 or six linear system to solve. If you push that up much higher, you get ill conditioning effects and you cannot uh, get good results. Right. Um, also, uh, when the singularity structure is more complicated than just, you know, well isolated branch points than we just had, or when the singularity is like a logarithm, uh, these, these methods uh, have difficulty to deal with that. Um, so here's an example, for example, where the residue is small and then you cannot pick that particular uh, pole up. At least the classification will not classify it as a, as a square, as a pole of order two. So uh, you really should be careful with these. It's, it's, uh, it's more of an art than a science. And, and, and it's only when you use them in combination with our analysis that uh, you can uh, trust them. 
Right. I said, uh, let's now apply this to a few uh, more interesting equations than just the inviscid burgers. So, for example, we go to the viscous burgers, where we now have a viscous term on the right. What does that do to the singularities? Uh, then uh, there's KDV, there's Benjamin Ono, there's nonlinear Schrodinger. Uh, all three of these are uh, in the family of, uh, you know, the integrable soliton producing equations. In all of them, uh, we don't have the diffusion term on the right, but we have a dispersive term. Um, uh, KDV uh, has this uh, dispersive term in the form of a third derivative. Benjamin Ono, uh, Hilbert transform of the second derivative, and so on. And then finally, and this is the new stuff that I have uh, promised in the beginning, uh, discussion of the nonlinear heat equation, where we have a finite time blow up, uh, and where the singularity structure is, is certainly a bit more complicated than what we have seen up to now. Um, those of you who are interested, um, I have a paper in this upcoming uh, proceedings of the Valencia meeting, uh, and in that, uh, the first four equations are represented uh, as examples, and all, I also have a few animations on my website. Um, I believe in the in the abstract of this talk, I had promised to talk about nonlinear Schrodinger. Uh, and the Benjamin fair instability and so on. But uh, when I practiced this talk last night, I realized I'm not going to make it uh, in the lot of time. So uh, I won't be speaking about that, but uh, it is in this paper here. Um, so very quickly, uh, what happens if we add viscosity to the Burgers equation? It turns out then that you do not have the shock, as we know. Uh, the uh, uh, the profile steepens, but it doesn't quite become infinite, uh, and uh, eventually uh, it just dissipates away and becomes steady state. And what happens in the complex plane is then that branch point converts into strings of poles, uh, and these you yeah, now have these poles marching along the imaginary axis, but don't quite reach it because you don't have blow up, uh, and then. Uh, eventually they turn around and go away, uh, and that's when you reach steady state. This is a picture of what happens. Um, uh, just a word about the uh, display. The color is the same as before, namely the phase, but now I've used the third direction, uh, the vertical direction, as uh, uh, the modulus. Uh, in this way, it's kind of easier to distinguish poles as peaks from zeros, you don't have, you know, zeros will just show up as a, if you have a flat picture, it's difficult to tell poles from zeros, but now you can see them as these spiky thingies. So um, I actually have a uh, an animation of this, but in the sake of time, I'm not going to show the animation. Uh, I can just appeal to your uh, imagination. Um, so, so you have this, uh, these poles come from infinity. Remember, we start off with sine of x, which has no singularities. And then as time increases, the poles come um, marching in, uh, down towards the, um, the real axis, uh, but they don't quite reach it. Uh, uh, so there's no uh, collapsing, there's no shock. Uh, and then they start marching away. Uh, as, as represented in this picture. And eventually they have all retraced back to infinity and you get the steady state solution. Um, how about KDV? We've seen KDV first thing this morning. Uh, uh, and, and that's of course the famous equation that uh, gave rise to the concept of solitons. Uh, and this is uh, the, going back to the original zabuski kruskal experiment. So when you add dispersion to the right-hand side, as opposed to diffusion, uh, you don't have poles coming in along the imaginary axis. Well, you do, but the dispersion have them drift off into the complex plane, and eventually they line up uh, parallel to the real axis, uh, as is seen 
in this picture here. Now, <clears throat> this is the famous picture from uh, the original zabuski kruskal experiment where they discovered the soliton and announced it. Uh, I, I suppose this is probably the most famous picture in, in all of applied mathematics. Uh, this is uh, their, their initial condition is just a cause. I've used the minus sign. Uh, I've just transplanted their solution to my minus pi pi with a minus sign x uh, as initial condition. Uh, and then this is what the zabuski kruskal picture looks like uh, in the complex plane. And I'm, uh, I'm rather proud of this picture. I, I believe this is the, the first time that the, uh, the complex plane version of the zabuski kruskal picture has been shown. Um, uh, so, so you can uh, identify eight poles in the complex plane. Again, this is the upper half plane. There would be a similar situation in the lower half plane. Uh, and each of these poles are represented uh, as one of the solitons. Uh, these, these don't look like round towers because the scales on the uh, real and the imaginary axis are quite different. This is minus pi pi, and this is only going to a half in the imaginary axis. Okay, these poles are of order two, and one for each soliton. Right, uh, here is the new um, computations that I promised earlier. Actually, um, the, the nonlinear heat equation goes back for me to quite a number of years to the early 2000s, but I've recently returned to it and now I've made a more thorough study and this is what I want to talk about today. So we have the uh, nonlinear heat equation. It's the regular heat equation with a quadratic nonlinearity. And so let's uh, pause for a moment to think uh, what will happen here if you if you ignore the nonlinearity, uh, you just have the regular heat equation, and we all know what that does. If you start off with a cosine initial condition, things will just flatten out, and you'll end up with uh, a uh, the zero steady state. Uh, on the other hand, if you only have the nonlinear term, well, you can solve that, then it becomes an ODE. You can solve it, and you find that uh, it blows up like one over um, constant minus t. And so you have a finite time blow up. So there is a competition be between these two uh, terms. One would like to flatten things out. The other would like to have things blow up. And uh, the question now is which one wins? And it turns out uh, nonlinearity always wins. But uh, depending on your initial condition, uh, diffusion can put up a good fight. And let's see what the complex plane tell us about this. So we'll, we'll be using this constant alpha time uh, that, uh, to, do, to, to, to uh, uh, define the strength of the nonlinearity. So we're going to start off with a fairly large alpha, alpha equal to two, and then we see on the left here, this is the picture. We start off with a cos, uh, two cos x. Um, time evolves in this uh, into the picture. So we see the, uh, the amplitude growing and growing and growing, and we hit the finite time blow up uh, at roughly time, uh, just slightly bigger than 0.8. Okay, um, here is what the Darbo estimates give us in terms of the location of the singularity. Uh, again, it's an, an entire function initial condition. Singularity starts off at plus infinity. It zooms onto uh, the real axis and then it slows down a bit. I guess that's when the diffusion term starts uh, putting up a fight. But eventually, uh, nonlinearity wins and the singularities reach the real axis and you have a blow up. Here is uh, what one sees in the complex plane if you use um, the quadratic fourier pide method. Uh, here are a few snapshots of the solution at various times, a relatively small time. This is still close to the initial condition cos x or 2 cos x. 
uh, here uh, the non-linearity effect uh, can be seen and then this is just before blow up at time point eight and here we can see the position of the singularity uh, uh, in each of these pictures in the upper half of the complex plane um, in these uh, matches uh, what their Darbo estimates uh, predicted in the previous picture. So at time point four, we're slightly above point two. At time point six, we're slightly below point, uh, sorry, two. Uh, and, and at time point eight, we're slightly below one, and that matches. Uh, at time point four, we're slightly above point, uh, above two, just below two, and, and just below one. Uh, Right, so uh, we have a position of the singularity tracked down fairly well. What is its type? Uh, if you look at this uh, very quickly, this may look like poles of order two because we uh, the colors go around twice and they go around uh, in the in the right direction for a pole. but if you if you zoom into the picture, you'll see there is also a phase jump right at the top. So these are not just simple poles, but these are uh, in fact uh, branch points. There is a uh, there is definitely a branch point uh, effect uh, also at work here. Uh, of course we're just doing quadratic per day so our um, approximation space uh, will only allow square root singularities. It turns out that these are in fact logarithmic singularities, but at least our uh, square root singularities gives an indication of a branch point as we saw in, in here. So this is what I meant by um, uh, the, the fact that uh, one should always uh, complement these type of numerical studies with proper hard analysis. Uh, if you didn't, you would easily miss this uh, logarithmic term in the singularity expansion. Um, uh, and, and this is work that I'm continuing with Marco Fassendini and, and John King. Um, if, if you reduce that uh, alpha parameter slightly, things become even more interesting. Now the, uh, the, uh, the nonlinearity is not so strong anymore, so diffusion uh, puts up a longer fight, the singularity comes in, uh, and then, but then it turns around and moves the other direction for a while before it starts zooming in onto the real axis. So it's, it's almost as if uh, the diffusion is winning the battle. Uh, and then if you reduce the alpha even further to a half, uh, you almost reach a steady state, uh, or at least a flat, um, the solution uh, before blow up takes place at a very, very, very rapid rate and very challenging to compute. Um, I have some animations uh, if, if anyone is interested and I can, that I can show, but uh, let me wrap up by saying uh, uh, it's, uh, this is uh, really fun. Uh, I really enjoy this this type of stuff. It, it can aid in the understanding of, of nonlinear phenomena. Um, these uh, the, the French physicists who did it originally, uh, they claimed that it can resolve a certain uh, paradoxes that was out there in the literature. Uh, uh, but it, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the the the, the, the most fun here is, is is the challenge it poses to numerical methods in order to do this uh, accurately. And then, if you have a, an interesting PDE to consider, uh, well, please send me the law. So I am happy to take uh, questions if there are. Um, and if anyone wants to see uh, an animation, I can, I can also show that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So if there's any question, uh, I think the audience can just write. Uh, so be before uh, receiving the, the, the other question, uh, I have a, a maybe one stupid question. Uh, how did you choose the degree of the polynomial? Because sometimes you put 17, sometimes 11. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, let me let me explain that. Yes, uh, if you have thirty-five, uh, if you use thirty-five coefficients, uh, then uh, you can match a polynomial of degree seventeen divided by a polynomial of degree seventeen. Uh, that that's just the arithmetic works out, uh, and uh, and if you have three of those. Uh, well, you have to reduce the degree to 11, 11, 11. Uh, it, it, it's the, uh, uh, if you do Pade approximation, you just, it's, it's related to how many terms you can set to zero in, in this expansion. Uh, okay. You don't want to make these, these degrees to, the, you don't want to pick many more coefficients because, um, uh, then the ill conditioning starts getting to be a problem, as I mentioned before. Oh, so it's a bit of just a numerical trick. But, uh, it's it's just a miracle trick. Uh, you you want to have enough to capture the solution. Uh, good. You don't want too many because then things get ill conditioned. As I said, these things are. Uh, it's a it's more of an art than a science here. Okay. Thank you. So there's one question in the chat. I don't know if you can read the yes. chat. So if you have uh, another question from Nabil. If you cannot. Yeah. I can't read it, but can anyone read it for me, please? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do, do we have an explicit time of blow up for the nonlinear no. heat equation? No, we don't. We, we have some estimates. Uh, but no, we don't. Uh, my collaborators and I are working on this. Uh, there are estimates, but there is uh, there's no uh, explicit formula. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Is there any other question? I have a, a, another question about the, yeah. the, the, the KDV equation. Yes. And also about the viscous burger equation. Uh, yeah. Uh, is the uh, do the number of uh, singularity depends on the value of uh, of new? Or yes, 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 yes. So, um, so if if you make new smaller, that is, you're getting closer to the you know the the, the non-viscous case. Yeah, okay. um, then you get more and more of these. Uh, the, the the singularities are denser and denser. And so when nu goes to zero, that's when uh, the poles, uh, the term they use is pole condensation. Uh, then then the, the, the poles become effectively a continuum of poles making up the, the branch cut. So uh, in the, in the original, the, yeah. yeah, same, same with, the, uh, same with the, the KDV equation. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, so okay, so in the KDV, uh, uh, in the KDV, uh, small more small more dispersion KDV. limit, small dispersion limit is a very tough problem in KDV. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking if you uh, have the same behavior as the in, in the real case. Uh, I, I I I don't know. Converge. I don't know in in KDV. I really don't know what the limiting distribution of these poles would be. That would be yeah, an interesting okay. question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, Nabil? Okay, so Nabil, another question. Um, you always uh, choose uh, U0 as a, as a sinus or cosine? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the reason is simple, simply because I, uh, I yeah. could, you know, do a lot of analysis with a, with the sign, uh, and, and the other thing that interests me about the sign is, uh, or a cosine, uh, or an entire function is, you don't have poles initially, but they get born immediately at at time t greater than zero, and that sort of fascinates me uh, how they enter into into the domain. Um, another interesting question is, for example. Uh, KDV, uh, if you do the analysis, KDV poles will be uh, poles of order two. W what happens when you start KDV with poles of order one initial condition, right? Uh, it turns out they, they disappear 
immediately and become poles of order too. Uh, and that's another fascinating thing to study. And I, I haven't done much experiments with that, but uh, I've, I've observed this kind of thing. So maybe in the same spirit of, uh, of question, if you consider other kind of, uh, I, I was wondering if we can, can consider of, uh, uh, kind of complex poly polynomial instead of the exponential, instead of the Fourier, uh, Fourier series. Oh, um, hmm. If you have uh, another complex uh, uh, basis. My, uh, Personally, I have never used anything but uh, Fourier series and periodic boundary conditions because uh, it's the simplest, right? It's very, very, yeah, it's very suitable for, for this kind of but, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so this is, you have no that question? Okay, so uh, normally we should, uh, we should uh, conclude. So, uh, yeah, so this is time to, to conclude. So thank you. First, thank you very much for uh, every speaker coming from uh, all around the world. So we have from Asia, from Europe, from Africa, and from uh, America. So even with the, the time delay, so thank you very much for, for, for being here and for all your, your presentation. So let me thank uh, our audience. So this, I think the speaker cannot uh, see uh, all the participants, but uh, we had uh, plenty of, uh, of people who, who are watching uh, your talk. So if you have any question in the audience, I think you can write, uh, you can write us or the organizer or the, the speaker. I think we, we will be happy to, to, to answer. So let me just finish by uh, uh, thanks my, uh, my co-chair, co for sharing me, with me the, the, this, uh, the, the organization. So thank you, Maelia. So take care, all of you. Hope we can uh, meet uh, soon in, uh, in the real life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.